Listen, everybody, we all know that real estate is the most proven way to build wealth. But why isn't everyone wealthy from real estate then? It's hard to know where to start. And most of the education out there is just complete trash. And you end up investing your money on a series of courses instead of in real estate. That's not how this podcast works. We give you the blueprint to successful real estate investing and bring on guests actually willing to share their secrets. I started my real estate investing journey as a freshman in college when I bought my first duplex and have been in the trenches doing deals ever since. And today, I now own hundreds of millions of dollars of investment property. On this podcast, you will learn what you actually need to know to be a successful active or passive real estate investor. And we'll offer our takes on what's happening today so you can navigate this market and build wealth. I'm Drew Brenneman, and this is the Brenneman Blueprint. All right, welcome to the podcast. I have Tom Stein, Director of Investor Relations for Brenman Capital on the on the pod today. Yeah, great to be on the podcast, Drew. It's been a long time coming. Um, yeah, a uh, little bit of background about myself. I uh, cold outreach to you in 2014. I was a student at University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, your alma mater, and uh, I was looking for an internship in Chicago. And uh, you happened to be, uh, yeah, need someone to help, uh, you know, kind of run your some property management, some leasing uh, around Chicago. So I, you know, took the job obviously in Chicago. And um, after college, you know, I, you guys weren't set up to, you know, fully hire someone, but uh, hired me full time back in 2019. So I've been here five years and have, uh, you know, done a lot, you know, asset management, acquisitions, uh, property management, now a lot of investor relations. So, um, you know, a lot of experience, great time uh, being a part of Bretham Capital. So happy to be here. Yeah, it's been a, yeah, been a nice, uh, Nice run so far. Yeah. And it's, it was interesting too. Yeah. I posted on LinkedIn. I mean, as you know, of course about, I found the, uh, the email you sent me and then screenshotted it. Um, that did really well where I think people like seeing the, the hustle yeah. and then it working out. So yeah, the so. cold outreach pays off. So it's, uh, you know, <laughs> definitely keep it going for anybody that's listening to the podcast. Never, you know, don't doubt yourself, just reach out and don't hesitate. So. Well, nice. Well, yeah. And so today's what we wanted to do was do an episode about the uh, most common questions that we hear from investors. It's been a while since we've done an episode, too. So thanks for uh, bearing with with me, I guess, where it's yeah, I've been a busy summer, had another another baby boy. So got two kids now and then um, this lots going on and then had a busy, busy summer buying two deals as as well. So we're all caught up on work and time to get the get the podcast out again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want to do like a round ball? I mean, we can just go one by one or, um, I think that that would work. Yeah. So we made a list, so we're just going to go yeah. off the list almost like this is a Q and a, so, um, yeah, we didn't, we don't have like a plan format other than we made a list here. So yeah, I think I'll just get it going. So I think probably the most common thing we get answered. So I'm curious to hear your, your answer on this one, Tom is, you know, people ask yeah. what's your investment process, you know, at, from the LP standpoint. So how does it work? So you like send out deals by email and then what happens after that? Yeah, it's essentially that um, we do direct syndication deals. So essentially, like once we have a deal under contract that we want to acquire, we, you know, send out, you know, an email blast to our investor database. And then, they, you know, they have an option then to see this uh, via email. We do do a lot of follow up calls and texts to, to our LPs. And uh, essentially, once once we have a deal under contract, we start raising um, you know, investors see the deal via email typically, and then they're able to soft commit um, via email or text or a phone call conversation thereafter, kind of firming up their commitment. Once we have their commitment, then we start kicking things off with the accreditation process. So um, investors have to be accredited um, to invest in this deal because it's not registered with the SEC. Um, so it's essentially to be accredited, you have to you know make 200K in income the last two years or have a net worth of 1 million plus. There's several ways to verify that you are accredited. Um, we do we have an online third-party service, um, or we could send you a, a, a template for your CPA or attorney to sign on, on your behalf. So once you're buttoned up and you are accredited, um, your your commitment is locked in place until we until we close on the deal. Um, you know, we we open up a bank account for you to fund your commitment closer to closing. After you're verified as accredited, we do send out the operating agreement. The private placement memorandum and the sub agreement, and we typically give you, you know, two weeks to review those legal documents, um, and before you electronically sign those for signature, like for to legally commit your commit yourself to the deal. So it's a, you know, typically I would say sixty day process overall um, between you know getting the deal under contract and closing. That could vary slightly, but uh, we aim for you know 
60 day close because we use a lot of agency debt. So 60 days to close typically. So from the, uh, the point of under contract to close at 60 days in that time period, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's a pretty button up approach and um, pretty seamless, honestly. So, but that's typically how it's all structured and how it works. And then for, um, yeah. And then on the, being an accredited investor, you know, that's uh you have a $1 million net worth and that's excluding your, the equity in your primary residence as well. And then if you're married, the income threshold is 300,000 a year. And so then I think if, uh, you know, uh, the next question we hear is, okay, you just mentioned all those different types of documents, like how, what are those, you know, so how, how do you describe what's the private placement memorandum? Private placement memorandum is basically, uh, you know, setting up the deal, like the legal structure of the deal. So essentially it sets up, uh, how the, like a management LLC is the, you know, controlling entity of the deal and then how the, um, the LPs are structured and like they buy shares of the particular LLC that owns the building operating agreement is basically, it outlines, you know, the structure for, you know, the contributions, distributions, how things are structured on like, um, you know, on a waterfall approach and subscription agreement basically locks you in place for the, for your commitment amount and, you know, buying the actual units of the LLC that owns the deal. So, um, all three come in tandem. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process. Yeah. And the private placement memorandum, my, how I describe it is that's really, that's a disclosure document. That's not, you know, none of the, none of the things mentioned in there are setting out that the, this is the term of the, the deal that all lives in the operating agreement. It's just usually what the spelling out is. It's saying, okay, here's how the decisions are made. And so it's repeating what's in the operating agreement. And then it gives you you know, five pages of, you know, risks related to that. And so that's, yeah, I go private placement memorandum, disclosure document, operating agreement, it has all the governance and um, economics in it. And yeah, subscription agreement commits you to the the uh, investment amount and the interest that you want to want to make. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think, you know, I oftentimes I, you know, I get asked if we have a fund. Mm-hmm. So then what yeah. what's the answer there? No funds, uh, direct syndication deals. Um, so every single, you know, every deal that we have, it's its own entity. So it's not, you know, related to any other deals in our portfolio. Um, you know, several times I've been asked, you know, if, you know, property on our track record goes down, does that affect my returns? And the answer is no, these are all direct syndications with no, no relationship to any other properties in our portfolio. Okay. That's yeah. We should just start jumping around our list now. Cause if you just yeah. brought that up, then probably people would ask the next question is, well, how, how are they not connected? Like, how is it set up then? Yeah, so there's a specific LLC that owns each property, um, and they're not related to each other. So you, you know, as you you as an investor, you're buying shares of a particular LLC. That particular LLC owns one single asset, um, and that loan on the property is only applicable to that one single deal. Every property is a single entity. Um, simple answer, uh, but yeah, there's a you know no risk of an, uh, if a, a, another deal in the portfolio is you know performing badly or, you know, not hitting its, uh, metrics, it's not going to impact your returns on a particular deal. Yep. Yeah. They're all separate. And then, um, you know, one thing that I learned and then as, uh, the term shares is for corporations. So then, you know, I, I always call it a membership interest, you know, cause they're buying units in a, in an LLC. And so, yeah, that's, you're in one LLC and that LLC is getting its own loan It you know, it, it owns the one property, you know, so yeah, it's all separate. And then the, all the loans work the same way as well. So then, you know, the no loans are tied together. You know, it's all just the loan was made to that one company because it, you know, ha- owns this this property and this much, you know, cash equity is going into it. Yeah, typically, I think then sometimes, I guess, uh, going back to the first question, I think I've been asked mm-hmm. what happens if a deal doesn't close. So I'll, I'll just take this one then. Okay. So if let's say someone were to, do everything Tom just as the LP laid out and they sign all the documents. Let's say they're investing $100,000. They send in their $100,000. At that point, the LLC is formed. Uh, the bank account for the LLC is opened. They're sending their money into the LLC's bank account. They've signed their documents. Their money is sitting there. And then if for whatever reason the deal doesn't close, uh, the investors would not be taking any sort of financial hit because of that. Like That would be entirely borne by by me, by the company where, you know, we are spending money to get the deal ready to close. You know, we have attorney, we have, you know, legal bills we're incurring, uh, you know, physical inspection, all the internal time we have, you know, doing lease audits and everything. And, um, 
are, you know, going through our 50 point, you know, due diligence yeah. checklist yeah. that we have. Um, but if for whatever reason it can't be closed, so it's, you know, I don't, um, and I have had this happen before actually, um, not, not on the syndication, but on a deal that I was just going to buy on my own and it, like at the closing table, like I couldn't buy it really? because of a zoning issue. Yeah. I probably never told you the story because it's so no, I never heard this. Yeah. Honestly, it's so sad to just be like <laughs> all the money you spent up to that point to lose it. And uh yeah, and right. I did. You know, you have an earnest money deposit up as well. So then that may be lost by the sponsor. Uh on that deal it wasn't because it was um you know related to something the seller didn't want to fix. And then um you know, at that point, we just, I got my earnest money refunded and was able to walk away. But you typically, by the time you get the closing, you've spent a lot of money and you have a lot of money and earnest money up as well as loan deposits. You need to make a deposit when you rate, rate lock. But I don't want to get too sidetracked. Uh, as a <laughs> passive investor, you're not exposed to any of that, or at least you're not in our deals. I'm not sure how everyone else has their stuff set up, but we don't, we don't touch the money um, that's sent in to the LLC's bank account, except to wire it in to close. Uh, you know, at that yeah. point, obviously, then we, once we own the property, we just start running the deal out of that and making, you know, paying bills out of it, collecting rent, making distributions to the investors. Um, but then that's, uh, you know, we don't, we don't use the money for anything else prior to that. So once you send in the money, it's essentially not, not touched until closing. Yeah. And for whatever reason, it doesn't close. I mean, like we're going to wire you or ACH your money back to you. And that's, you know, that'll be the end of it. But yeah, that's how it would work on the, you know, finally. Yeah. And then I think another is similar to what we've already talked about, but I get asked all the time, like how the deals are structured legally, like, okay, then, okay, we're going to open up this LLC. Then like, how does that work? Like, what what do you say to that? Typically, Tom, or you want me to take it or? Yeah, I can take it. I mean, when the LLC is open, I mean, we structure it. Um, so Bradman Capital has a GP interest. That's the managing partner. Um, of the deal. And then the LPs then um, are a separate class of members that don't have, you know, um, ownership. I mean, they do have ownership in units, but uh, they don't have decision-making power. Is essentially what I tell people um, that the decision-making power relies or is, you know, the responsibility of the Brenneman entity, essentially. So there's two separate classes of that LLC that own the building and one class has decision-making power and one class does not. And that class is basically the LP side of the deal. Yep. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's exactly right. Where yeah, everybody who's an investor is a member in the LLC, the LLC that owns a property, and then um, you know, for governance, yeah, we 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 as the 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 GP we make the decisions, and so like yeah, legally that sits with me. You know, I'm the decision maker, and then we don't you don't have to worry about okay, there's 30 investors in this deal. Do we all have a say? I have to you know get majority vote. Like we we have the. uh Decision making authority. It's says, and we're just going to do what's best for the deal and follow along with the business plan that w- that we outlined. And then, what about for being? Uh, we touched on you know uh, accredited investors. Like when you said yeah. you jump off the accreditation, what does that uh, what does that mean? Why are we doing that? Sure. So basically, because we invest via the five hundred six C exemption under Reg D of um, within the SEC. So we have to verify that you're accredited to ensure you're able to invest in um, an entity that's not, you know, regulated uh, by, you know, financial regulator. So to be accredited, basically, um, we've we've had, you know, several different entity types invest in our deals, trusts, LLCs, um, individuals, um, your IRA accounts. And essentially it boils down to, you know, how is the entity accredited? Um, and there's, a, you know, different ways to do it. An LLC or a trust has to have uh, $5 million in assets or each member of that trust or LLC is accredited. So there's like multiple steps to look through. But essentially what we're doing is basically verifying that you are able to take the financial risk to invest in something that's not regulated. Um, it's a private offering. So we have to go through this uh, kind of legal requirement for, for you to, you know, invest in the deal. So many ways to do it. And we can accept many different entities. It's not, you know, it's not too complex it's at all, but it's just uh, something that we have to do legally. Yeah. And then we take it a step further where we're doing verified accredited. And so that's just to basically protect everybody. You know, all the investors can rest assured that everyone is accredited because we went as far as Tom saying, if you want to invest with your LLC, we're going and saying, who are all the members? Okay, are they all accredited? 
and then they, you know, and doing all that, all that work. And then it does happen where, you know, on any given deal, we'll have, you know, I don't know, two or three people that committed and then they weren't able to get verified. And then, then we, we don't, we don't accept them. And so then that's, I think just makes it more safe for everyone knowing we are fully compliant and, and verifying that we are with what the SEC requires. Yeah. And like several other, several investors have said, oh, I usually just check a box and my legal docs and that's all it is. But we, we take it that extra step, like Drew mentioned, just to, you know, make sure that we're absolutely 100% compliant every deal. So, yeah. And then you can, you know, once you're verified, accredited, and you have your letter um, from your CPA or this third party service we use, you know, other people in your CPA can do it too, attorney, financial advisor. But once you have that, it's good for a certain number of years. And then, so you, you know, it's, uh, you kind of do it once and you're good for three to five yeah, years. So I have to look it up. Yeah. It's five years. Yeah. So, um, the only thing that you have to do, um, on a sub- subsequent deal is sign a simple statement saying that my entity has not changed from the last time I was verified. And that's, it's a really simple thing that we send you via DocuSign basically. And it's just basically you're verifying that nothing's changed since the, the time you were previously verified as accredited. So. Yeah, uh, with your like financial process. situation, yeah, right. that it's not yeah. gotten worse or anything. Okay, yeah. yeah, I think then just going off this back to this list. I mean, really, how do taxes work? That's I don't know, probably the second yeah. or third most common question. I think I feel like I'm answering. Do you you want to take it or you want me to do it or? Yeah, you can do that one. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so how just similar to how your interest in the LLC and in the property works, where you own a sh- a membership interest in the LLC that owns the property. You know, for tax purposes, it's almost you're getting the same exact tax treatment as if you owned the property directly. So you're still able to share in your any in, you know, any any deductions we're taking. And that includes, you know, all the deductions for the expenses you pay, including just regular, you know, repairs and maintenance and uh, your loan interest on your on the 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 loan will take out, but then also you're able to depreciate the property. So you're able to take this deduction or just like if you were to buy, let's say a computer for a business, you can write that off over a certain number of years. We're able to do the same thing, but with the building. So we can write off the building improvement value over a 27 and a half year or 30 year time period, depending on what's done um, with certain elections uh, on the return on the time period. But So what happens is you don't need to do a whole lot of extra tax work on your side and you're going to get a, you know, a K-1 tax form at the end of the year. So we need to file a tax return for the LLC. It's a multi-member LLC, which is taxed as a partnership. So then we have to file a tax return and then all members get a K-1, which has their share of the income or loss uh, shown on that K-1. The income and loss amount doesn't correspond with the cash distributed. So, um, you know, let's say you have a deal that the, because of the depreciation deduction, you, it's, it's showing a tax loss, um, but cash is actually paid out. That's the most common scenario. I mean, most all of our deals, that's a scenario that they have. And so then you'll have a K1 that let's say maybe says minus $10,000 on it for, for income or loss, but then you are paid, you know, five or $10,000 throughout the year. Like that's a, very common scenario. And then you would take the K-1, you give that to your CPA who's doing your tax return. They input it into their, you know, to their software and then, you know, it sits on your return. But you don't need to do uh, anything, you know, special for the LLC or anything like we're doing all that work. And then all the income and all the expenses are already included in that. So you just need to, you know, have the K-1 reflected on your personal income taxes. And then um, I think we were talking about this before we got started. And actually we didn't, there's no, we didn't, I didn't do any sort of disclaimer. So yeah, also I'm not a CPA or an attorney. So consult with your, um, you know, with the CPA or attorney before, you know, um, taking this as the gospel and same thing, Tom's not a a CPA either, but we've, uh, we're just regurgitating what ours are telling us. But yeah, we're also, we don't know your individual situation too. So there's a lot of different things. And then one thing we were just talking about is if you need to file a state tax return or not, and then that's, you know, dependent on your situation. So let's say you live in, let's say you live in uh, Texas and we buy a property in Wisconsin. Well, Texas is a funny example because there's no state tax returns there. So that, but you're filing a federal return and you, where do you put the 
income or loss uh, on your tax return for you know the state purposes, it's on a Wisconsin tax return. So some CPAs, it's like 50-50. That's what we we're talking about before you hit record was we'll tell you, yeah, even if you have a loss, you need to file that tax return in Wisconsin. And then like half say, don't don't bother. There's no um there's no penalty because there's no taxes owed. Um, but the by the book answer is you're supposed to file a tax return in the state that uh, the the property is in. That's where the income's generated. So, like for me personally, like I file tax returns in Arizona, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, um, because that's where all the properties are. You know, and if if that's uh, no extra work on my end, I just you know we just send over my you know twenty five or whatever K ones to. <laughs> to, to rob and he just pops them in my return and you know we check it over make sure he didn't you know miss one and we're, we're set so um what I, what i missed tom it's uh anything or i guess when yeah we aim to distribute k1s by march 15th every year before your you know april 15th tax return deadline um so we you know we try and hit that and for every syndication deal we have hit that and uh, we want to keep that going what else did you miss uh, i guess yeah i mean i guess we obviously are not cpas but we Typically, your losses here, like you're gonna lo- you're gonna have a loss carry forward on your tax returns, but typically those losses are only applied to your passive investments. Is that correct, Drew? Yeah, I think that's okay. a. We should do a common misconceptions yeah. episode. That can yeah. be uh, number one. Where um, this is, yeah, really getting in the weeds. So definitely talk to your CPA. But this is, um, you know, a lot of people they think if you are, let's say, in my example, I think I said let's. Uh, you're getting a $10,000 loss. Let's say you are like a salesperson, you get you paid a W-2 and then you have this $10,000 loss and you only have invested in, let's say one property, the single syndication deal from us here, that $10,000 loss, you, there's not, no type of income that they're generating that that can be used on. You can't use it on um, your W-2 income Unless it's a very specific circumstance where you're a full-time real estate professional, like a real estate broker. So we do have a number of real estate brokers that, you know, you know, invest with us. You know, I I like to think it's because they see what we're doing and see the deals we're buying and think that we're, um, yeah, that's part of it. You know, the the smartest guys in, you know, in the room at times. But, uh, I think it's also because they can (laughs) use the losses against their commission income right away in that year. So then they're able to, to save a lot in taxes, but that's, yeah, I think that's a common thing people are confused by where they're going, oh, I got, I invested a hundred thousand. I mean, this is how it worked in our, in our Laughlin deal. It's basically like 50 cents on the dollar of losses where you invest a hundred grand, you would have got a $50,000 loss uh, allocated to you in, in uh, 2023 here on our uh, most recent deal that we've done a tax return on. But if you are not doing, if you don't have any other real estate investments and you're not a real estate professional, you can't use that 50,000 yet. It just yeah, gets suspended right. on your return. Like Tom's talking about. Yeah, definitely a common misconception. So I would, you know, talk to your CPA and how you could lose these, use these losses and, uh, you know, do your own research. But, uh, yeah, there it's, you know, very tax efficient investment. So I think that, uh, goes on to our next question here about, you know, if we could explain the tax efficiencies of real estate and I, I typically, Talk about the four, you know, tax mission pillars, basically. And Drew mentioned a lot of them, uh, but I mean, all of them, basically, with depreciation, interest, uh, interest deductions, and then you know, the uh, refinance proceeds are tax free because of the, it's an exchange of debt. And then you have the ability to 1031 exchange. Um, so if you sell a property and you uh, want to defer your capital gains, uh, you have you know a limited window then to buy a new property to de- off- to defer your capital gains until you. Finally sell, you know, hopefully never, but, uh, you know, it just keeps, keeps kicking the can down the road with that 1031 exchange option available to you. So yeah, that's, you know, full, full circle, how it's that tax efficient, you know, these, these investments. If you would say, can you 1031 out of a syndication? What are you saying typically, Tom? Typically, I mean, we have not done it yet. Um, it's possible. Yeah. I, I think it's called a, you know, drop down. Yeah. I'll jump in. It's, it's just, if it's your, a regular, just your, if, if nothing spe- special is done to structure, like what you're starting to talk about, the answer is yeah. no, you cannot 1031 out of a syndication. So as a investor in a syndication, what you own is a interest in a LLC. You don't directly own any real property, which is what it has to be sold and repurchased to do a 1031, but you can do a 1031 
um, if the whole entity that you're invested into does a 1031. So from the IRS standpoint, the taxpayer. So let's say, you know, as far as for a 1031 and out of a syndicate, out of a syndication, you know, the answer, if unless there's any structuring is done, the answer is no, you cannot. Because so you own a as a investor in a syndication, you own a membership interest in an LLC, not directly in to real property. And that's, and you need to be owning real property or real estate directly to do a 1031. You still, it's still possible to do a 1031. If you're into syndication, there just needs to be extra steps taken where from the IRS standpoint, the party that's doing the 1031 or the the taxpayer uh, would be the term for that. It's the partnership, so the the LLC. So let's say it's called One Two Three Main Street LLC, and that's what you've invested into. One Two Three Main Street owns real estate and can do a ten thirty one. So either if everyone in the deal wants to do a ten thirty one, you can just just do it. You know, I've done I think five of them that way, where it's just everyone wanted to do it, or it just was a deal on myself, and we did it. And then separately, if there's more people in it that do not want to. Um, do a 1031 and some that do, this is what you started getting into is you yeah. can do what people call a drop and swap. Now you form two LLCs. You put the people that want to do the 1031 in one and people who don't in the other. And now that you have both those LLCs own the property directly as tenants in common. And then you, but you have to hold that structure for a while. You're supposed to hold that for a period of time um, for investment purposes is the term. And then if later on you decide you want to sell, you can sell and then the LLC that wants to do the 1031 can, and you can also 1031 into a, a syndication uh, with the tick structure as well. So if someone was coming in with, uh, there's just a lot of costs involved to doing all this. And so if yeah. somebody's going to come into a 1031 or come into a, one of our deals and they have $1031, you know, our, you know, we want, you know, generally at least, uh, that would to justify the cost would need to at least be, you know, a, a two million dollar investment um, of, of cash to to justify all the extra structuring work and everything involved just in legal costs. That minimum sometimes is a bit of a moving target. I mean, I usually say two million is what. What have you been? I've said saying? a million. I mean, we typically don't have people that are coming in with that that those amount of checks, but uh, I've said a million typically just, you know, cause people with, you know, 50 to hundred K have asked if they're able to, but I think the legal fees would kind of exceed what they're contributing to the deal. So. Yep. And the only, the only time we've done that, it was yeah for th- three and a half million. So that was like a no brainer kind of size that made sense to do. And, but yeah, there's just a lot of extra work. Like they had to be, you know, underwritten as a key principal on the loan on that structure. Cause they owned over yeah. a certain percentage, you know, if you own over, 20 percent you got to do that but okay we're getting too far yeah. off the the list of questions here so yeah um when do we distribute k1s think we hit that and then um when do we make distributions what do you usually say for that well as funds are available we aim to distribute monthly um caveat there as funds are available we always have reserves at the property and uh, we never typically distribute um into our reserves just to hold something back at the property in case something unexpected you know comes out of comes up but uh you know as as funds are available we aim to distribute monthly for all of our deals okay nice and then i think um yeah maybe let's do um one or two more and then call it uh call it a day here you see anything on the i think the waterfall one probably yeah we can talk about the waterfall i'm asked about that a lot um and i think you know going forward i think we'll stick to typically what we did on our last deal which is um pretty pretty straightforward in terms of, you know, how it's structured for the investors and, and ourselves. So I can talk through that example. Um, so the waterfall we have, um, like I mentioned before, we have the LPs and we have this, the manager, like the sponsor entity, we align interest. So we, you know, give LPs an 8% preferred return, which accrues annually. Um, so if you don't hit the 8% preferred return, the tax under the principal and starts accruing. Um, and then it's a return of capital to our LPs. And then from there, it's a 70-30 split. So out of every, you know, say $100, uh, $70 goes to the LPs and $30 goes to our our, our manager entity. Um, so basically, it aligns interest right there. We make more money as you make more money. Um, it's quite simple. And uh, it align, aligns interest. And I want to caveat that 8% preferred return to the 8% preferred return does not equate to the, the underwritten cash yield uh, or the cash on cash. 
Um, so it's, it's a different metric. So if, if we're underwriting, say, 5% cash on cash for the year, that's what we're going to be paying out. Uh, the 8% preferred return is, you know, that'll start accruing because we won't be paying you the full 8%. So basically, it'll start accruing. But then I just want to caveat that there is a difference between the preferred return and uh, the expected cash on cash yield. Yeah, that's a great explanation. I always do the the part about if, if the whole preferred return is not paid in full in a given year with an example. I think that okay. I've always, yeah. I, I just will take, let's say, and I just use, especially if we have a deal that we're talking about. So um, yeah, I explain it the same way you do where, you know, the first dollars are paid out or for the, to the preferred return. The preferred return is cumulative and compounding. So, you know, meaning like, so if let's say, the cumulative nature is if less than um, the eight per, let's say it's 8% preferred return. It's if eight less than 8% is paid out in a given year that the part not paid out accrues to a future year. That's the cumulative term. And so like on Fairhaven court year one projected cash flow was 5%. So assuming we just hit, let's say we hit that number exactly and 5% is paid out. That means another 3% of preferred return has, you know, is going to accrue into future years. And so then, um, you know, again, it's not guaranteed that that money is paid out, but let's say, you know, in the next year, cash on cash, let's say it jumps to, to 10, the investors would get all 10 of that because they're getting 8% for year two, as well as they need to be made whole on the 3% they didn't get yet. So then that's, you know, that's usually how I explain it. And then, um, when people say it's when we, ours is cumulative and compounding, you know, what the compounding part means is on that 3%, let's say that wasn't paid in my example, that's earning interest, so to speak, at 8% while it's not being paid. So so that's what gets paid first. Then the next dollars as they're available once the press been paid in full goes to return a capital. You know, So then investors get all their money back. And then the next dollars after that, we start getting split 70-30. And so, yeah, it aligns interest like Tom's saying. And at least from a I just I like that set up the most just because I just like for some reason like that before we get paid anything that investors have all their money back and have made whatever the preferred return rate is. I just yeah. I, a lot of deals, they start paying the term for the money we would receive. They would call it like a carried interest or incentive fee or promote. There's, you know, they have to have three terms for it instead of one. But, you know, they have I just uh, a lot of deals, they start paying that fee to the sponsor once the preferred return is paid, but you haven't got your money back yet. And I just, I don't know. I just like having the investors have all their money back and have made at least whatever the hurdle rate is first right. before we, we get anything. So I just think that's the best for the investor. So I just want to want to do that. Yeah. Most investors I've talked to really like our setup just for the simplicity, honestly, and like the way it's uh, just aligns interest. It's really clear what's happening. Yeah. I mean, most deals I see, they have like, this is a good point to talk about. That's, you know, maybe it's not a the common question, but it's, uh, it kind of is because they're talking about fees, but yeah, well, most deals I see, they have like anywhere from, I don't know, five to seven different fees being charged, you know, yeah, acquisition fee. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. Acquisition fee, um, guarantor fee. I've seen that. Um, and then a disposition fee too. I, I always, I always caution investors. If you see a disposition fee, just kind of be wary you know, because like as sponsors, then, you know, they're going to make money guaranteed no matter how well the deal does, which doesn't really seem ethical in my mind. But uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of ways for you know sponsors to kind of charge fees and a lot of not a lot of them are, I would say, right. You know, like I, I like how we set ours up and it's kind of like, you know, 1% acquisition fee, typically 1% asset ma- management fee, typically. And then it's, you know, the waterfall, which is straightforward and just that aligns interest and like I said, we make more money as you do. So we're, we're all in, all in alignment here. So, yeah. And those are the only fees we're charging where, yeah, to your point, I mean, it's not, it's often, I mean, some of these, you know, biggest groups out there, I mean, they charge a 4% acquisition fee, uh, one and a half percent asset management fee, a fee to refinance, a fee to sell, you know, and then, then you just think about the alignment of interest, like uh, no matter what they're, they're making significant money i mean this in guaranteed yeah. fees that example i'm giving they're charging like five times as much as we are and yeah. you know and so then there's just more incentive to um say okay let's just let's let's just do deals you know i think that's 
Yeah, that that's a good point. And I think let's let's just do one more question. And I think sure. how often do we have deals? I think that let's um let's end on that one. Um sure. I'll take it because I think it's a it's an important thing that's like a personal thing too, in a way for me, because it's you know, it's um like I just really think that because I get asked, you know, sometimes about like what's the goal for the company or how, you know how big do you want this thing to be? And I really don't think about that stuff. And then it's kind of funny because we were, I got asked today and this is what prompted doing this podcast, to be honest, like a new, like some new questions I've never been asked before. And one of them was like, what was your asset manager? What was your assets under management five years ago? What is it today? What's your goal with it? And I told him, I'm like, honestly, I don't, I don't have any kind of goal like that. And I'd have to go back and calculate what our AOM is five years ago, but I bet it's like a hundred million five years ago. And today it's yeah. two fifty. but I don't, that's not what we're focused on at all. Like we're focused on doing good deals. I think what I'm pleased with is, you know, our average IRR is a 24% IRR, which is, you know, if you're unfamiliar, it's very similar to this, an annual to an annual return IRR, but it has some time weighted elements. And that's across owning a, an average whole period of over over five years. So it's not like we just bought something for a year or two and then, you know, generated that kind of IRR. And that's that's on twelve deals. And so I'm just we're very focused on our track record and doing good deals. And I I think that's how this company grows the best. And also it's the best for the investors. So I don't really see it as another way in terms of just the deal cadence is when we have good deals. And so, you know, in 2023, that meant, um, you know, interest rates went up. It was harder to find good deals. We didn't buy anything from July, 2022 to November, 2023. Yeah. And then, and then this year, you know, we didn't buy anything from, um, all year until, um, the Lawrence closed in August, you know? And yeah, so, late August, yeah. and then that's just the, the pace of it, you know, it would be, be great if there was more, stuff to send our investors. You know, we do these, you know, calls where we're answering these questions, Tom and, and I, and we, um, people say, this sounds great. Where do I yeah, sign up? Like, deal? we're yeah. like, I'm ready to do it. And then that's when I get the fund question. Like you got a fund or something I can jump in now. And it's like, no, no. we, we just, <laughs> we send out the deals as we have them. And then, but we don't have anything right now. <laughs> you know, yeah, we yeah. we're really picky. And then, uh, if you would have talked to me and, January 1st, you know, um, 2024, we didn't have a deal to send you till like July. So, you know, a lot of time goes by. So potentially. Yeah, a lot of lag time, but uh, we do focus and, you know, we wait for the right deals just to emphasize Drew's point. So I always answer that. I mean, we, you know, we talked about once trying to do, you know, four or five deals a year, but that's, it's basically just boiled down to like, we got to do the right deals. And, you know, we wait for them, wait for the right opportunity. And, they come in spurts. I mean, in 2020, I think that was the biggest year in your history. And I think there was five deals purchased that year. And I don't think any in 2021 or a couple in 2021, but you know, it just comes in spurts, comes in waves and you just have to wait for the right opportunities and good things happen to those who wait. So, um, you know, anything's possible, but, uh, all right, great, Tom, let's leave it there. So then let's say people like what they've been hearing here. What, uh, how do people get in touch with you? Yeah, great. So my email is tstein, that's T-S-T-E-I-N at brenneman.com. Or you can go to brenneman.com and navigate to my Calendly link, which you, which directs you right to my calendar to schedule a 30-minute call or Zoom with me. Um, so I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. All right. Great job. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Drew. If you learned something from today's show, leave a review and hit that subscribe button wherever you enjoy your podcast. Dive deeper into real estate investing on Brenneman Capital's website, Brenneman.com, where we have numerous free resources and information that can help both active and passive real estate investors. Accredited investors can get started today as a passive investor in our multifamily investment opportunities by hitting the Invest Now button on our website. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Drew Brenneman and guests as of the date of recording and do not purport to reflect the views or opinions of Brenneman Capital LLC and its subsidiaries. Views and opinions are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon or deemed as investment or tax advice or an offer to buy or sell securities. The speaker cannot be held responsible for any direct or incidental loss incurred by applying any of the information offered.